Hello, everybody. Perfect. Thank you. And we're back. The marathon continues. This time, it's the more recent Marvel film, Spider-Man Far From Home, which is the, well, I guess it's the second outing for Spider-Man in terms of his own films. But he's been in quite a few by now, right? Like, how many has he been in? Like, five or six? Five. Yeah, five. So we've had a good taste of Tom Holland as Spider-Man. He's got a good amount of minutes. He's had some really emotional roller coaster moments as well, especially in Infinity War. Um. How do you think Far From Home went? Let's just jump straight into it. I love the movie. It's my second favorite. It's, I put it over um, Infinity War. I mean, Endgame for me as a Spider-Man fan. Okay. And how do you think it compared to Homecoming? Has it changed your view of Homecoming? Ho- Homecoming is still my favorite Spider-Man movie, but Far From Home is like knocking on his door right behind it. Okay. For me, I, I thought I thought Homecoming, I always thought it was like a solid 7 out of 10. Uh, I don't think it was like an amazing film or anything like that, but it was a, it was a good reintroduction. Um, I think this is a much better film, to be honest. Uh, I, you know, I'm not saying it's like a nine out of ten or anything like that, but I I think it was much better. It was had a greater scope as a second film would. But what I liked about it is they delved into the relationships more. So okay, you had various action things as well, but you had a. I mean, I mean, like Birdman, not Birdman. You know what I mean? Michael Keaton in the first one. I thought he was a really good. Uh, villain I thought the twist was amazing I won't say it just in case and um, and here I thought Jake Gyllenhaal was excellent his his character was really nuanced as well I loved the special effects of how they actually executed his villainy that was one of the best things about this film actually because at a certain point you're like okay this villain's going to do this villain this villain's going to do that but this was really unpredictable and really disorientating and I loved that um, I loved how it introduced and well, not introduced. Like, I guess it just progressed the the narrative arcs of so many of the kids from the first film, but especially Zendaya as well. Um, I think I think her story with um, with Peter Parker was just fantastically held. Um, Marissa Tomei, oh, she's just gorgeous, lover, always will do. People of my generation will always fancy her, and I think the, the, her kind of relationship with Happy was interesting. So I, I just think, and the way that they just sort of hopped around Europe as well, obviously I'm from Europe. So I think that was just a little bit closer to home for me, if anything. So that that was kind of like a nice kind of, because I've been to most of those places. I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, so that's cool. Um, I mean, what do you think were kind of the principal driving factors that, that made this film successful? No, it's the fact that not, to, to me, I think to, to, to me, it's kind of like, it, it kind of picks up on the themes of, um, of uh, Captain Marvel in a sense, especially when you have, spoiler alert, the scrolls around and stuff like that. Um, the director, John Watts, said that he called this movie a con movie, where everything's a con right there. And uh, after you watch the movie, it's like, if you watch the um, cold open before the before the Marvel title credit card comes up, it's like when you see um, when you see uh, uh, Samuel Jackson, we, and I see him actually, Nick Fury and, uh, and Maria Hill driving up to that place, and you see um, Mysterio, it's funny, and then Mysterio says you don't want any of this, and you, and then when you realize when he says you don't want any of this, is that everything in that opening scene is a lie? Nothing in that scene is true. It's like the whole, the whole entire opening scene is a con. The whole entire, the, the, the way that place looks is a con. Maria Hill and Samuel Jackson aren't, aren't who they say they are. Mysterio isn't who they say he is. That monster who they say it is. So it kind of sets the tone for the whole entire movie in the sense like you don't want any of this. And the whole port, the whole goal of Mysterio is trying to peel away lies. And make his version, his quote unquote version of the truth, be real and stuff like that. It kind of builds off the fact of um, going back to Captain Marvel, where it's like propaganda and lies, and who's real, and who are you really, and who are they really, and who is that, and kind of like um, Mysterio kind of peeling back Tony Stark in a sense, like okay, and it comes down to like Happy saying like the world loves Tony Stark and this and that and blah, 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 like that. It's like, but Tony Stark was a mess. It reminds you, it reminds you of the Marvel superhero universe. It's like, these people are a mess and they're always a verb away from being the bad guy in a sense like that. It kind of re, re- reiterates like how um in the, the first in the first Homecoming movie where the Vulture, he was like, but it also reminds you that these guys are making bad choices too. They have a point, but they're still, they're, they're still 
just as. I always make this point of these Marvel superhero movies. It's like, these bad guys are what the Marvel superhero characters would be if they didn't have a moral compass. They would have a point, but they would always teeter off into this, this, this weird kind of thing in a sense. And it's kind of like going back to where how, how Peter Parker is kind of desperate for like a, uh, a mentor. And he's so desperate for a mentor and Mysterio exploits that need for a mentor. And it's kind of like him getting out of, I think this movie, the metaphor for Spider-Man is like, you can't trust these people and you have to get out of your own. You have to get out of these mentor shadow, become your own man. It's like more than, more so than even homecoming. Like this is the whole thing of Spider-Man getting out of his shadow. And a, and a metaphor at the end of it where it's like, okay, now you're Spider-Man. The whole world knows you're Spider-Man. They're not going to expect to be the, the, the next Iron Man anymore because they know who you are. Now, what does that mean to the rest of the world now? Yeah, I mean, if we take it quite chronologically, I've got a couple of points to speed off, but I can't, I can't go without that opening scene after the cold open. And, uh, oh my <laughs> God, that was just, that was honestly... One of the best things I've ever seen in 23 films or whatever it is at this point. It was just so hilarious. It was so out of character. And it just wrenches you out of this whole kind of, you know, Avengers Endgame saga kind of thing. And just brings you back to Earth with such a bump. It's just hilarious. And you're right, because because that kind of is... It's kind of like a setup for the whole film in a way. Because you've got some kids who, you know don't really know what they're doing and they're at the start of a journey and they will come back as different people but they're delivering this news yeah i I use air quotes liberally with that and and the thing is is that iron man himself is obviously deified in this film and completely deconstructed within the same you know short period of this film and that's one of the brilliant things about it i think that there are two main targets in this film i've not really articulated it before because i haven't done a podcast on this so this is the first time i'm sort of really saying it but i think silicon valley is one of them for sure and i also think that you know the whole fake news thing is is definitely yes so so in terms of if we take silicon valley because i've not really talked about it Silicon Valley, there are so many worries right now about about the direction that it's heading or the lack of direction and a lack of a moral compass that they just innovate for the sake of it and they innovate before an innovation is even finished. So you've got like this constant stream of things and frequently it's just for the sake of it or it's just for the the sort of, you know, capitalist nature of it to kind of profit and profit and profit some more because frequently a lot of them are public companies now. And, and there are so many worries. And, you know, I've said it before as well. Like, I have massive worries about drones moving forward. Like, if they if drones get into the wrong hands, what are you going to do? You know, if, oh, yeah. like, like, for example, you know, if there was a drone with a fucking machine gun, it would just fly around. I'm sitting here recording this podcast and it would just shoot me and there's nothing I could do. I'd be dead. Bang. Gone. And no, please don't do that, anyone to me. So, um, <laughs> but but in terms of that, you know, if if this technology gets into the wrong hands, yeah, and, and frequently, and then that ties in, what is the wrong hands? The fake news will manipulate things and they will get this technology and they will use it for their own agenda. And, and so there's this the kind of war between propaganda and then there's a war against Silicon Valley. But then in this, it converges into Jake Gyllenhaal's character. And I think the way that he kind of, you know, he, there's such a switcheroo with him, which is brilliant. I think it's pretty obvious that it's coming. You know, you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know something's going to happen. Fair enough. But it's about the motivation. Well, yeah, in terms of the, the way that, you know, he's initially introduced as a friend to Spider-Man and stuff like that. And eventually, you know, he, obviously he sort of reveals himself after after Peter Parker leaves the bar and gives him the glasses. And then he kind of, you know, but even at that point, you know, he, he's saying, oh, Tony Stark was a right arsehole, blah, 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 blah. This is what he did. He stole blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay. I have like a, a tiny amount of sympathy for you right now because clearly you have some sort of motivation you've been wronged. But as the film goes on, he turns into this whiny fucking geek, basically. And I say that with all the love in the world, but it, that's that's what he's characterised as, effectively. Um, and I was like, why did they go that direction? And then it started to click to me that this, this Silicon Valley thing, imagine like a sort of like beefier Mark Zuckerberg, you know, kind of thing. Who's kind of like, he feels so entitled and so wronged and so entitled. I'm just going to do this. I don't care. You know, Mark Zuckerberg actually like the, all the reports on him or the inside reports from it is that he's kind of like, he really doesn't give a shit about anything. Like he really doesn't care. Like the, the, this sort of media campaign he's been on, which is the most transparent thing. Yeah. And, and, and again, and that kind of deals with fake news because Facebook is an arbiter of fake news. That's one of the reasons why, you know, your country's fucked up and why my country's fucked up, basically. Oh, you know, yeah. it's not like the sole reason, but it's an enabling factor, right? And, and you know, the, the way that it's played with in this film, like, you know, the, the, the sort of 
dramatic reveal at the end of, of in the mid credit scene uh, of how, you know, oh my God, Spider-Man is Peter Parker, blah, blah, blah. And then you have like, what's his face? Jonah, uh, J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like Alex Jones kind of guy. Yeah, like I mean, so so if he returns from the original, I mean, that's huge, and he could be one of the the big agitators moving forward in the in the future films. Exactly, because I feel like I feel like in the um, I feel like I was like I, I'll be shocked if the media is not the main enemy in the next movie. I'll be shocked because it looks like it's, that's the way it's yeah. going. Like me right there, and I think the, also going back to the Silicon, Silicon Valley thing you're talking about. The one interesting thing is I think people will pick up on is. How willingly eagle, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like a Stockholm syndrome. How those workers in Stark Industries are used to being abused by their bosses. Yeah. Like he, they're, they're literally okay with him putting their guns at his head. Like, okay, he's like, it's like, how do you feel with a gun at your head? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that kind of gives you an idea. Like how, um, I don't, maybe it says something, maybe that says something about Tony Stark or maybe that, maybe Tony Stark stopped running, running Stark Industries right away. But at least it was like that at first Iron Man movie like where um, Jeff, Jeff Bridges' character was like abusing that one guy. It's like they're used to being abused by these, this corporate culture. It's like, okay, they're so ruled by fear and by greed that they'll go along with it. Cause, cause, cause Mysterio's talking about if some people gotta die, they gotta die. And they're like not even batting their eyelashes about that. If you're talking about Silicon Valley stuff, like, they, they don't care about the repercussions of what happens to other people. The only thing that happens, the only thing that they care about is their agenda and about if it works for them. And even, even one of the most kind of like environmentally concerned companies and, and sort of, you know, quote unquote ethically, you know, I guess kind of true companies is Apple. Apple had fucking Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Who was the biggest asshole to his workforce? I mean, you could not get a bigger asshole than Steve Jobs in, in many respects in terms of the way he psychologically abused them and the way that he just shouted at workers and said, no, you're fucking stupid, blah, 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 blah. Constantly. This wasn't like an occasional thing. This was just an everyday occurrence. If you haven't read the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs, is brilliant. You have to. I, I felt it was like quite a well-balanced kind of, you know, thing of, of what, you know, his, ge- his genius and his absolute assholeness and and yeah you're completely right and but then you know apple get a free pass but you know there was so many times when you know they hired foxconn and foxconn workers were fucking killing themselves literally killing themselves so what did foxconn do <laughs> they put safety nets in so that they couldn't kill themselves Jesus. this is the kind of and and when you pick up your iphone you don't think about that and and in terms of the fake news thing and the Silicon Valley things. These are two of the biggest things affecting the generation who are the starring generation in Spider-Man. These kids, these 15, 16, 17 year olds. Yeah. You know, you and I, we're the guinea pig generation. We're the ones we're fucked up already. Yeah? There's nothing going to save us. <laughs> but, but these kids, these 16, 17 year olds or whatever they are. Yeah. That, that they are the ones who are going to be manipulated the most by the media. Yeah. At least we, at least we didn't have the internet growing up at that age, like in like a huge way. Right. And, and Silicon Valley was still in its nascency. So we have like a sort of different viewpoint on what they will have. They have grown up with this shit. They've grown up with phones in their hands. They've grown up not knowing effectively who to trust. You know, they don't know actually who to trust now. And that must be such a difficult thing. And I think that those are some of the plot points in this film that are getting laced exactly. for the second one. Or the third one, rather. I feel like going back, all we go back to this movie, going back to Ultron, where he says, where he pretty much ruins the end of the MCU, talking about they're doomed. Like they're, the human beings are headed on a, on a collision course with doom. And even the vision agrees with him, but the, the vision's outlook is, okay, at least we're giving it a good try to try to be better. But Ultron is like, okay, we, they both agree, we're both fucked, but at least try. The Spider Man movies, why I like these ones so much, is because the two villains so far are pretty much giving a lesson to Peter Parker, like, okay. You're gonna be so disappointed in this world when you get here. <laughs> and the, like, like that's the point. That's the, the, the people say these movies are happy go lucky. Like, no, they're not. You listen to what the movie is saying. The vulture is telling vulture told Peter Parker is like these people don't care about us. We build their roads and we do all this stuff like that. But those guys up there is like he's like he's like Tony Stark is like you, you complaining about me making money off of weapons manufacturers. How do you think your guy up there made his money? How do you think they do that? They're also they're reminding Peter Parker and they reminded the audience don't worship Tony Stark. Like you may like this guy. But they're reminding you, like, he has issues. Like, just reminding you right there. Because I think sometimes sometimes critics and sometimes people look at these things at a surface level. And that's another line in Age of Ultron where Ultron is, like, typical human. Look, they, they, they barely scat the surface. They never look, they look, never didn't look within. It's like these movies keep reminding you over and over again. With Thanos and with Loki and with um, Ultron. They're telling you, like, these heroes that you're worshipping, they're, they're degrees of way from being us. 
That's what the movie is trying to warn you. Same thing with Wakanda. Wakanda did this isolationist thing where they, they had the equipment to help other people, but it's like, no, we worry about ourselves. We don't worry about anybody else. Asgard, you know what? We'll, we'll take your shit and then we'll act like we're good guys later on. It's like Stark Industries, where weapon manufacturers don't need to be responsible for that. Every shield, where we're, we're going to make drones, we're going to kill people. It's like, it's like every, every time in these movies, they keep showing you that these good guys that you worship, they're good. But don't forget that they work for institutions that are just as bad as they are good. And I think that's what Sp- Spider-Man Far From Home is showing you. It's like, it's this innocent kid, Peter Parker. Like, he's good. And the crazy thing about it is, and, and, to- and once again, Tony Stark is corrupt and innocent. Tony Stark, he, his mind was, his heart was in the right place, but he's no different from his dad. He put drones in the hand of a kid. Even though you, you know that kid is good, he, it's like that one, my favorite scene, like that, people's like, aren't they, aren't they, aren't they endorsing that a kid has drones? It's like, the one scene that reminds you that they're, the movie's telling you that, that it's not okay, is when Peter Parker goes back to the room with, um, MJ. And MJ was like, you had drones? It's like, you, like, you're in charge of drones? It's like, you almost killed Brad? It's like, the movie's telling you right there, it's like, you may think, okay, you may have fun with this stuff, but this is not okay. It's like, it's like cause here's the thing I think sometimes, I think, especially with, I think sometimes, I, I always make this argument, and this is a discussion for another day, because you're a critic, we can talk about this later on. I think they have to adjust their rubric for certain, some of these movies sometimes, because I'm looking at it, and I'm like, these movies are telling you that these people are screwed up. They're doing the right thing at the end of the day, but they're in screwed up situations and that. It's like, but the movies are reminding you, like, they're, they're, some people say, these movies are telling you that the good guys are the good guys, and the bad guys are the bad guys. Like, what movies are you watching? Because I think they're so used to, and maybe you agree with me on that, like, no, certain movies, like, especially when you write art house movies, there's a certain way to tell you how things are complicated. But in these movies, they're not doing that. They're just giving you the situation and letting you figure out if it's good or bad, in a sense. I don't think they're, I, I don't think they're giving you, they don't, they don't give these Marvel movies enough credit for that, right there. It's like they're not doing it the art house way where it's like, okay, you follow this path line. And then here's the part where you kind of go, okay, this is something wrong, this is something wrong, and it tells you it's wrong. These movies are like, okay, enjoy the movie. But if you sit there and really think about our movies, then this is okay. <laughs> yeah, and I'm jumping off from that. In the end, Peter Parker is a kid who just wants to be a kid. You know, he just fancies this girl and wants to tell her that, she, you know, he loves her and stuff like that. And that, that's when he's talking to Jake Gyllenhaal's character and he's saying, look, what do you really want? And I know he's trying to hustle him. I know he's trying to hustle the glasses off him, but he's still kind of right. He's saying, look, you know, and, and, and this is exactly the point that you made. Tony Stark bequeathed him the Edith glasses. Did he really, should he really be giving that kind of power to a 16 year old? Isn't that kind of dumb? And like what I said before, what if that power goes into the wrong hands? Yeah. That's exactly what happens. Bang! It goes into Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting his character's name. But I know. Let's call him Mysterio. But Jack- just call him Mysterio. Yeah, call okay. Mysterio, so yeah. it goes gets into Mysterio. Because Quentin Beck's not even his real name. Because remember, Quentin Beck's not even his real name. Oh yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. You don't know his name. You don't know his name at the end of the movie. Yeah. So okay, so he gets the Edith glasses, right? And 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 then it, you know, this is exactly it. It's like, what if this technology that has started from military operations or from Iron Man or this or that, whatever, for nefarious reasons, which is, is you know, held up as like a, a moral arbiter or, you know, protector and things, gets manipulated by someone who is not good, yeah, or who has a grudge or whatever, whatever. And, and that's what happens in this film. And... You know, it's a lot to put on a kid's shoulders. And and sometimes, you know, I'm, I am I reckon, you know, obviously you and I are a bit older now and stuff like that. I'm sure these millennials, a lot of them are thinking, what the fuck, man? You know, they're, they're, what kind of world are they growing up into? You, every generation feels like they're growing up into a world that's worse than the one before or better than the one before. Yeah, frequently both at the same time. But these kids have a unique set of problems and life comes at them so quickly. And I think that's the difference is that change for us was much more incremental growing up. You know, we were a guinea pig generation, but like every few years something would shift. Yeah. For them, it's every few fucking months something shifts or every week something shifts. And, and, and this is, they're kind of bombarded by this. And, and sometimes I don't blame them for just wanting to curl up and watch fucking Netflix and shelter away from the world. And if you're looking at the Iron Man, <clears throat> the Iron Man principle of what you were saying before, how they're kind of, you know, worshiping him whilst forgetting all the bad things that he did, that's what happens when someone famous dies. Yeah. Everyone, fa- you know, today, like, Amy Winehouse, it's been eight years since Amy Winehouse died, right? And I fucking love Amy Winehouse, but Jesus Christ, do you think, do you think all the people who are like, oh, rest in peace, but Amy Winehouse, rest in peace, and including myself in this, 
were talking about how much she fucking drunk and the self-destructive path and the, the arsehole boyfriend that she had that used to enable all these things. None of us were talking about that because we have now deified her because she was so unbelievably talented and successful at what she did. But actually, when you just scratch the th- surface and think about it, you're like, man, fuck. You know, there were a lot of concerts she turned up to and, and just, you know, passed out drunk and people just lost their money and stuff and really hated her for a long time, you know? Yeah. And, and so, you know everything is complex and and you're right the way that marvel presents it and i I think it's also as people grow older you know if you were like 10 when fucking iron man came out yeah you'd be 21 now watching endgame and spider-man so you're going to be a completely different person you know you're twice as old and and you'll you'll be able to sort of see the nuances more potentially or whatever and grow and, and and see the repeat viewings and stuff Oh, this is deeper than I thought it'd be. <laughs> See, I, I tell people that it's weird because all this was was set back way back when. But I think it's like going back to what I said. It's like people are so some people. Like I said, if it's not for you, it's not for you. But it's so easy for people to dismiss stuff. I think also the other thing I think sometimes is I think sometimes I think some of the critics want these superheroes to be want the superheroes to be simple, and they get bothered when they not when they're not as straightforward. I was like. But you said you wanted more complexity in your storytelling. Like the world is complex. It's like the good guys do just as much bad as the good. It's like, I was like you talk. Look at the countries. Like look at the UK and the United States. We're we're supposed to be the most sophisticated countries on the planet, supposedly. It's supposed to supposedly be the most sophisticated, and we're doing the most effed up things right now. It's like come on now. It's like look at that. It's, look what's going on right now. It's like the the like. The Avengers are us. It's like Captain America Civil War. It's like that stuff is is, is totally relevant. They asked Kevin Feige, he's like, do you guys um do you guys write write this stuff on purpose? It's like he's like it's like he's like he, he said he, he made a point. And it's like this is what most artists like. When you when you tell stories stuff like that, it's like it always happens that whatever is relevant in time, it comes out of your artists and onto that stuff like that. I'm pretty sure a lot of these people, the directors and writers of these movies, a lot of stuff is on their minds. And it happens to come out that way. And it goes out and goes forward. Like Ryan Coogler, he was like, from his point of view of Black Panther, he was like, he's like, if I'm if I'm if I'm a black man in America, how would I feel if I found out there was a Wakanda and it didn't help me? And that's where Kilmer came from. That's the idea that Kilmer came from. And like, there's different attributes, and I'm pretty sure with John Watts and these Spider-Man movies, he's right from the perspective like these 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 bad guys are preparing Peter Parker and by extension these kids for disappointment of life. These bad guys are telling you when 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 Peter Parker says to um to uh to uh um Mysterio is like I trusted you and he's like hurts don't it and he and he sees and, he, and Mysterio sees Peter Parker's um of na- naivety and hope as a weakness it's like you can't be weak like that this is not the the this world's not going to entertain you like that this world's not going to entertain your innocence it's not going to entertain your sense of right. Yeah, um, there there is actually quite a lot to unpack from this film in terms of, yeah. I mean, okay, so let, let's just narrow down on a couple of things. So how do you think Tom Holland is Peter Parker? He's my, we're going to be different. Like, he's my favorite Spider-Man by far, without question. He, the, 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 the one that I've read in the books, for me, I, there's other people that can disagree with you on that one. But for me, because I think, the, for me, I think the thing that helps him more than it helps Toby or, um, or uh, Andrew Garfield is, is in Spider-Man comic books, his supporting cast is just as important as he, because who he's around defines Spider-Man as much as it. And when I watch the other movies, like other than MJ and Harry, like he's pretty much by himself. He doesn't have that cast of characters that he hangs around and this and that and stuff like that. But when I watch Homecoming and when I watch this one, it's like, because part of Spider-Man's thing that the other things miss, it's like, it's, it's a high school soap opera. It's like, it's like the drama of it all. It's like, like with his, with his, with, with the friends and that, oh yeah, we met each other and like, we're going to be bachelors. And he gets on a plane with the girl and he's like, oh, we're together, boo. And then at the end of it, he's like, he's like, we're over stuff like that. Like you don't, you don't get that high school drama of it all. They're so eager for him to get out of high school and just be a, a man or whatever like that or just get involved in that stuff like that. I think for me, he gets, and like I said, it's almost like it's Batman beginning because he's not all, and the funny thing about it is John Watts is being clever. He's not the Spider Man that we know yet. He's on his way to being that Spider-Man. Each step he's taking. Like, for example, the Spider-Sense thing. I like how he attached the Spider-Sense to his awareness of bullshit. 
Like the other Spider-Man movies, he already had a spider sense and it's always there no matter what, no matter what. But in this movie, people are like, why, why, is, why wasn't his spider sense on and off? It's like his spider sense is inconsistent in the other movies. And then it wasn't until this movie where he learns that you can't trust everybody that his spider sense is on point. And then and, 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 and that scene on the bridge where it goes all dark and he goes, I'm Peter Tingle. He's not falling for the bullcrap anymore. And then at the end where Mysterio's on that ground, the fake Mysterio, and then he grabs the gun from the other Mysterio and like, you can't fool me anymore. That's his rite of passage right there. Now he's learning to be a little bit more that Spider-Man that we know now. Because Spider-Man, because Spider-Man is really not, as, as he grows into Spider-Man, he's not as naive as that. But he's drawn into that Spider-Man now. So I think the goal for them was to, um, was they're going to treat him like Harry Potter. Where it's almost going to be like a three trilogies, where it's like a high school trilogy, a college trilogy, and a adult trilogy. Where like in the Harry Potter movies, he's grown up to be a man, and with these ones, like you'll see where. So when you go back, for example, I'll give you a prime example. Um, and it's a musical thing. If you if you pick up on it next time, um, there's a theme that is Spider-Man theme. Like, dun, 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 dun. and the first movie, it sounds like he's a he's a he, it's like it's like a kid adventure. Like he's a high school kid right there. But if you listen to it again. On this one, it it grows up as he grows up, so it becomes more it becomes more man masculine as he grows with it, kind of thing like that. It's like those the small little details in there, but I'm getting back to what I'm saying about Tom Holland. But to me, I think he's my favorite because he's finally got that cast that Spider Man didn't have in the other two. I think he's great because he's surrounded by great people. That's just how that's how I feel about it. I think. All three Spider Men are great in their own ways for what they were serving for their movies. Like Raimi had a vision, and Tobey Maguire served that v- vision well. Um, Mark Webb had his vision, even though I didn't like those movies, but I thought Andrew Garfield did what he needed to do, and Emma Stone. They were the two best parts of those other Spider Man movies, but he did what he needed to do. And I think that he's sur- because Tom Holland is surrounded by a great cast of. I don't think there's any. I don't think there's a, a bad link in any of the cast members. I think that. He has the room, and like I said, it's too early right now, even though he's my favorite. He has, you have to give him a couple more movies, but if they keep going on the road, he's going to be going down, then he might go in that pantheon with the other main guys. Yeah, I think he's doing a great job. Uh, the, what What's impressive is, um, or impressed upon me, is how young he is, though. I think that's the difference, you know. I, I think there were people arguing about how old he's supposed to be or something, but I think effectively you should just call him like 15 and a half to 16 and a half, somewhere in that time. Yeah, he's 16, yeah. Yeah. So he's in that time frame, basically. Whereas, you know, from what I remember from the other Spider-Man films, the top, well, the top, I'm not even going to talk about the Andrew Garfield ones because I just did not, I didn't get anything from those. But the, the Tobey Maguire ones, I mean, the first one was really good the second one i thought was a great film actually i mean that that's i think that's really one of the best superhero films that there's been like this millennium probably um but he was older you know he was already kind of like he was already working and stuff right like so yes yeah yeah he's been known for a while yeah he was he was a he was he was like a known artist yeah yeah and like to put it into context, Toby Maguire is older than us. Like he's like in his mid forties. <laughs> but I mean, it, you know, it bears talking about, right? So uh, it's just a, just a different take. They took a kind of year zero thing with Tom Holland and introduced him from the very very start as like he's supposed to be basically a mid teenager. So it, it is a different feel to it. I do think it's been drip feeded over quite a long time. You know, like as we said before, this is his fifth film, like Tom Holland as Spider Man. Um, Whereas I think the the sort of condensed nature of of the Tobey Maguire sort of ones, the Sam Raimi trilogy, I mean, Spider-Man 3, I never really liked it. I don't think that many people loved it or anything like that. But the first two in particular were really well done. I think people do forget how good it was because then Batman came came along and sort of took everything in a completely different direction. Marvel just wasn't even on the scene until 2008. So, um, but, but it still holds up. If you watch it, it's still a really well done film. So I guess like... Marvel will steamroll everything, to be honest, eventually. <laughs> I mean, like in 10 years' time, like the Tobey Maguire ones would be like, some kids will be watching it thinking, oh my God, someone else was Spider-Man. So, um, but I, I do think um, it's going to be interesting going forward. How long has Tom Holland signed on for? Because like... He said he said in an interview, he was like, the, the third movie, but he said on, on record, he's willing to play Spider-Man as long as he can walk. Okay. He's happy to play that role. He said, he, he, he said I love this character. Yeah. He said, I'll play it as long as I can. He, I think his goal, he, he secretly said, people forgot his interview. He was like, I mean, I respect him as an artist for saying that. He was like, I want to be known as the defender of Spider-Man. How long, how long, how long it needs for me to take it to do that? Then I'm going to do that. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, if we if we look at the others, it sort of typically takes like what eight to ten years. I mean, like Black Widow's been around for eight nine years now. Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, all these kind of guys. Um, yeah. Okay. So I tell you what, uh, time is ticking on. So the only other thing that I really wanted to talk about was um, was Mysterio. Actually, um, how do you think Mysterio did? Well, I think he's one of the best bad guys they ever had. Not without question. He's up there in my top five without question. Easily. I think um, Jake Gyllenhaal, like I said, like you said, he brought nuance to it. Like the, the, the argument is Spider Man is too for Spider Man and Marvel's Man Universe. Everybody's got their own pros. Everybody got their opinions about the villain and stuff like that. Um, I have my opinion, stuff like that. But Spider Man is two for two right now with their bad guys. Yeah, which is more, which is arguably more consistent than the other, the other ones. I mean, other than the Avengers movies, I mean, the Avengers movies probably have the probably are more are as consistent. Or the Avengers movies and the Spider-Man movies right now are the most consistent as they come as they come to the bad guys. The Black Panther, I'm pretty sure I have no doubt. Part two is probably gonna have a, a, a great bad guy. But if you want to talk about more consistent villains, I think Spider-Man is two for two, without question, without question. Yeah, I would agree with that as well, actually. I think that's one of the strongest parts of it. Um, Gyllenhaal did brilliantly. I, I just think he's he's almost underrated as an actor sometimes because he's made a couple of wrong moves. But for me, he's made so many right moves over the years. Nightcrawler. Yeah, Nightcrawler. Oh, my God, in Nightcrawler. Well, I love Nightcrawler, actually. I think yes, me too. Yeah, he's hilarious in that. He's just brilliant. Um, I mean, obviously, he's been around a long time. He's basically my age. So he's been around a long time and he's had some really iconic roles. You know, if you're talking about like, I mean, Donnie Darko, I know that's probably not like a wider thing, but, yeah. you know. I think that's the thing right there. I think because he does those low key moves, I think yeah. he got stung by Prince of Persia and he, he didn't want to do that for a while because he, he tried for this, he tried for the big budget. Thing, yeah. And he got, and he got roasted for that. Yeah, I mean, and then he had Brokeback Mountain, which was really just an indie film that happened to like yeah. like the cultural touch. Pen. Cast the world by storm. Yeah, um, but yeah, you're right. Prince of Persia. I'd say Southpaw as well. If anyone's watched Southpaw, I thought that was a really pretty dull film, to be honest. I, I think that was a wrong. And then he had Death Tomorrow. It was supposed to be Eminem, Tomorrow. wasn't it? Southpaw, and then he, yeah, so we had to yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but but he's had some great roles. Like even in, we did a podcast about um, Oxia. Uh, was it? Oxia? Okja. Okja, yeah. Okja, yeah. yeah, he was in that as well. He had this hilarious cameo in that, and he just pops up every now and then. But he's just, you know, it's it's worth bearing in mind him and his sister are the fucking brilliant actors, you know, they really oh, yeah. are. So, um, and I think he's perfect in this film, even even when he puts on the um, the Edith glasses, and he does look a bit like Tony Stark, and you know, that's the whole point. People like, you want to hear, you want to hear something funny? You want to hear something funny? Um, here's a little hint, here's a little two, two little things you want to look for. Um, in the background, before they go to the bar, if you look in the background and stuff like that, you can see him and his other crew members following Peter Parker around, setting up the illusions. If you look in the background of the frames. And then if you're in the bar, if you keep looking behind Mysterio, there's certain things that gives Peter Parker the placebo effect to make him give the, the uh, glasses to uh, Mysterio. Okay, in what respect? Because I missed all of that. Um, there's, there's a scene where, um, when Peter Parker gets off the plane, like, you know how when he's getting off the plane, you see the pictures of Tony Stark around like that. You look in the background, you see Mysterio walking around him and stuff like that, making sure that he sees that stuff. Uh-huh. Or if we, when he's walking down in, um, in Venice, you'll see like his, 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 uh, his compatriots like around like that. And then you'll see certain things in the background in the, um, in the, uh, like, remember when she said, um, oh, you dropped these, these, uh, glasses? Yeah. Or if you see the scene where, if you watch the scene where they're on the rooftop, you don't really see Mysterio sit down next to him. You see Mysterio, if you watch it very carefully, you'll see how Mysterio sits next to him. It's almost like he's coming from behind Peter Parker instead of coming from in front of him. It's like just certain things you watch that you'll see that there's there's things manipulating Peter Parker all the way around it and whatever. So it's kind of like the, in the UK, we have this guy called Darren Brown, who's kind of like a mind manipulator. Straight, I mean, not like, you can't really call him a magician, but uh, I, I don't know what the word is. You, you, you know, like a master of illusion, I guess, like, or like a you know, yeah. trickster kind of thing. And, and, you know, when he gets people in his audience, he does live shows. And that's exactly what he does. He puts up these subtle visual cues here and there, and then kind of says code words or keywords or whatever, and he kind of manipulates them. Are you saying that's what's in the film? Yeah, yes. Wow, okay. Okay, when I watch that again, I'll definitely look out for that. That's really interesting. I think, he, I agree. I think he's one of the best villains um, that there's been. Also one of the most nuanced ones, because, you know, he's wronged for a specific reason. And, um, but then he takes that power and it corrupts him because power always fucking corrupts everyone. And then, and then like, like we were saying before, that convergence between technology and, uh, and 
you know, fake news and how that kind of translate. Is he dead? Okay, is he dead? What? They, they, they're, they're playing coy with that. They're playing coy with it. It's got to be dead, surely. I think it's a one. I think it's a one-off guy. I, I think he like this. But I mean, but the thing with Mysterio is there's been other Mysterios, right? So maybe they could bring Mysterio back, but it won't be him. But I'm pretty sure for him, I think for me, knowing the guy he is, I think he put everything into that that performance, and then he's like, I'm good. Now. Yeah, I, I I think so. I, I mean, that doesn't mean that he can't pop. Back I mean, you, he, he, he could pop up. At, he, he could pop up in a dream, or he could pop up in like another illusion. But I think that guy right there is dead. Well, I was going to say he could just pop up in video clips because he could have recorded a whole bunch of shit. But it shit oh, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. what he did at, in that, you know, that end credit scene or whatever it was. And, um, uh, you know, if, if there's like a drip feed of fake news from him, yeah, beyond beyond the grave, effectively, I think that would work particularly well. And Oh, yeah. But I think I think that guy is dead. I think that guy, him as a human being, I think that yeah, guy is dead. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, yeah. Okay, so before we kind of wrap this one up, what do you think is going to happen in the next uh, Spider-Man film? To me, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, because because to me, I feel like this would be this would be this would be the best one because he's supposed to graduate in the next movie in high school. If he if whether he's in high school, if he winds up in a Wakanda school, because he said he really wanted Tom Holland. I could see them even having her in his next movie. He really he really wanted to have Shuri because he wanted to see he wanted to see the two geniuses kind of like head off with the science stuff. But the way it's going and Jake, I think I, I was I was watching Whiplash the other day. And I'm watching J.K. Simmons. And this is this, this is how I would do it, just to say right there. You can have him do the Jake, you can have him do the J. Jonah Jameson, like Alex Jones persona on um, camera, but then have him be like a regular, like like some kind of the, the different kind of J. Jonah Jameson off camera. I can see J. Jonah Jameson being the main bad guy. Um, the media against Spider-Man, because in the comic books, he hates Spider-Man and he has a scorpion. Like be his henchman to go get stop Spider Man, whatever like that. And in, in Spider Man Homecoming, there is a scorp, there is a scorpion. Um, you, I don't know if you guys remember that in in Spider Man Homecoming, like there's a deal on the, on a boat, and um, the Vulture trying to make a deal with this um Latino guy, and he winds up in jail with the with the Vulture at the end. He's like, you know, Spider Man is. He's like, well, I don't know. And that guy right there is a scorpion, and James Jonah Jameson kind of has the scorpion go out to kill Spider Man. So to me. I can't. It's, it's, I can't see not, the media not being the main bad guy against Spider Man, and I can also see it being where how some people like it's going back to fake news. Like I'm pretty sure it could be easily proven that Spider Man didn't send those drones out, but some people will still stick with that belief that he sent those drones, even though there's proof that's like no, that's that's that lie. It's like our time right now. It's like the truth will come out, and people still won't believe it. So how can Spider Man fight that? The way that I saw it going until his identity was revealed was that, yeah, I, I thought like James, uh, yeah, Jameson would be kind of like, or the media at the very least would be the next villain effectively. But what I thought would happen is that he would graduate or whatever in the next film. And then he would go into work as, you know, work within the media in some sort of capacity. But then the kind of more I thought about it, once his identity has been revealed, and also I think, you know, the kind of his interest in technology and, the way that he's talking and then Jake Gyllenhaal says, Oh, don't be afraid of being the smartest person in the room. And then when he's on the plane making his own like uh, Spider-Man suit on, on Tony Stark's old plane or whatever, all that kind of stuff. I think that's leading to like what you're saying, more of a Shuri kind of avenue. Um, I, you know, he's not going to be the new Iron Man or anything like that because I, I think, oh, no, I think no, they're no, done no. with that. Right. You know, there's no point. Yes. They're done. Yeah. No, Kevin Feige said the next movie, he's his own man. He's like, he's like far from home is a metaphor of Marvel getting out of the shadow and Spider-Man getting out of the shadow of Tony Stark like this. We don't need to worry about. I mean, you'll hear about him here and there, but like this is it. Tony Stark made his mark, and it's the the Spider-Man: Home Far From Home was a Spider-Man movie. Plus, it was an epilogue for the last twenty-two movies. Like, okay, so now Spider-Man's his own man. Like the point, the reason why they had him say he's Peter Parker is like now he's Peter Parker. He's not that next Iron Man. They know who he is. So, who is Peter Parker to the world? Not who is Spider-Man to the world. Okay, right. Let's wrap this up. What were your scores for Spider-Man: Far From Home? Mine is eight point five. Okay, mine is eight. I really liked it. I think I think it's a definite step up from the first one, and I'm excited to see what direction it goes. In. Okay, we're gonna have a quick pause once again, um, and after this, we will come back with our thoughts on phase four. 